Good afternoon. Welcome to this uh, seminar by Dr. Vinod Thomas. Dr. Vinod Thomas is currently visiting senior fellow uh, at Institute of Southeast Asian Studies and previously visiting professor at the National University of Singapore. He's a distinguished fellow in development management at the Asian Institute of Management, Manila, and a member of the advisory panel on climate change at the CSEP. His current work deals with uh, uh, issues related to uh, risk and resilience, new directions in evaluation, climate change and sustainable development, inclusion and welfare. Previously, uh, Dr. Vinod Thomas was a senior vice president of the independent evaluation group at the World Bank Group, uh, then director general of independent evaluation at the Asian Development Bank. At the World Bank, he also, uh, he was also the director of the 1991 World Development Report, uh, and uh, he mentioned just uh, now that he visited CDS during that time when he was preparing the World Development Report 1991, and he was Chief Economist for Asia, Country Director for Brazil, and Vice President of the World Bank Institute. He has a PhD and MA in Economics from the University of Chicago, and a BA from St. Stephen's College, Delhi. And he has authored a number of uh, books and uh, articles in uh, reputed journals. Recently, he has published a book um, by Risk and Resilience in the Era of Climate Change. Now, this is a topic of uh, great current relevance. And this is an issue that, uh, you know, is, uh, is uh, guiding the current global discussions as part of G20 and many other things. So uh, it's a very timely and uh, CDS also has uh, interest in this area. And we are also planning to build our capacity and expertise in this broad area in the coming days. And with this, um, we and our um, we have a discussion formally, and uh, he has joined online. Uh, Professor Srikantha Gupta, welcome, Professor Srikantha Gupta. Uh, he is professor at Delhi School of Economics. Uh, Professor Gupta was Fulbright Postdoctoral Fellow at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Shastri Fellow at Queen's University, Canada. Currently, he is Vice President of the Indian Society for Ecological Economics. And prior to joining University of Delhi, he was at uh, NIPFP, New Delhi, where he set up and headed the Environmental Policy Cell. He has also worked as Environmental Economist at the World Bank at Washington, D.C., and as a career economist uh, in the Indian government as a, under the Indian Economic Service cadre. Uh, so with this, uh, I now uh, invite Dr. Thomas to make his presentation. Yes, you can do it, I think. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Birmani. Um, thank you for this occasion um, to is it okay uh, to um, to be able to exchange <laughs> views on this uh, very topical issue uh, that's taking us by surprise? It shouldn't have been because uh, even 1991, when I came here, 92, I think, uh, to present the World Development Report, uh, there was a section on, of course, on the environment, but also the emergency of climate and. Um, I don't think uh, it had any traction. Um, and we have had so many global meetings. Uh, they honestly don't go anywhere so far. Um, but uh, that's the question. I mean, you know, we can't um, just wring our hands. We need to know what is really so difficult about this issue and why is it that we can't face the issue. I'm delighted that Dr. Gupta is also joining from Delhi. Uh, Shanta Kumar is here. Uh, and uh, yeah. Um, and today is a very busy day. Many of uh, our colleagues are probably at the Keralium. <clears throat> so, special thanks for your interest and uh, uh, being here. So, in the inter interest of efficiency, maybe I'll just go to the slides. Um, the climate risk and response the book uh, that dr viramani kindly mentioned uh, 
is titled Risk and Resilience in the Era of Climate Change. So that is uh, the point of departure that risks are always with us. So how you build resilience is the only difference up to a point. Um, and um, resilience building is so different. COVID-19, same virus, very different results uh, in terms of the impact. Why? I mean, it's the same virus. Why should it be so different? Uh, and the list goes on, financial crisis, financial crisis, exactly the same degree of liquidity uh, tightness and very different impacts on un unemployment and inflation and so on. So uh, risk and resilience, and maybe this talk is not really about that. It's really about climate change. But what is different about climate change um, on this risk and resilient uh, uh, <clears throat> axis is that one, it is a global problem. Uh, so, I mean, COVID-19 is global, but it's very much at the local level that people go through hell. <laughs> Uh, the other difference is we used to think that nature is God-given and uh, it's unpredictable. You know, some countries get 12 extreme disasters a year, uh, Philippines, uh, some get half, Singapore. Uh, but when it will happen, whether it will keep happening, all of that is unknown. So it belongs to the bucket of uncertainty historically. So Frank Knight explained very clearly the difference between risk, a little bit of certainty that is going to be of this nature, and uncertainty. Something is not known. But the way nature, the God-given part of nature, changed and took us by surprise, although scientists have been screaming for decades, is that it is not nature only. The 2018 floods of Kerala, no amount of management, no amount of dam control. Yes, the dams are all open at the same time. It's, uh, you know, I would say common sense not to do that. So all of that true. Or if somebody hadn't lit a match and set a campfire, you know, in Canada or California, none of that is the, the fundamental reason. The reason is that the intensity of the hazard has changed dramatically and it is predictable. It will happen, the 2018 floods will repeat. It's just that it will be stronger if 99% of the scientists who say this are correct. There are still climate denied, deniers, but the link between carbon emissions and its impact on uh, intensity of hazards via temperature directly or via precipitation indirectly or via energy and more energy into the storm system. Whichever way it is, the link is clear, but it is not obvious, especially when the disaster strikes, nobody's going to remember the carbon emissions and the fossil fuels. They are fine, the fossil fuel lobbies are fine. Nobody can make that connection on in real time. So that's the, difference of the risk resilience um, axis when it comes to climate change. So the first part of the book is about risk and resilience of all kinds. But the second part is to say, okay, the climate risk resilience interaction is different in the following sense. Risks are going to rise systematically. So resilience is no longer the traditional definition would be bounce back, right? That won't work. If you fall from the bed, you just get back on the bed. No, the next level is higher. So you need to bounce forward. Uh, the, the, the height of the bed would have changed by the time you get up. So how on earth do you build in resilience for a worse disaster in the middle of the 2018 floods? I mean, I mean, we can only cope so much, right? You can barely stand on your feet and then you are told that the next disaster will be higher. This is the time to build that resilience. So the book, you know, says it's very difficult, but if society could do it, we, will, we, we may survive. If we don't do it, it is problematic. We will have an equilibrium. There's always an equilibrium. 
The question is, will you land softly or will you land hard? I mean, there'll always be a way out, but will it be a disaster? So with that as a background, I call it the biggest knowledge action disconnect humanity has ever seen. Um, um, so, uh, you know, the um, temperature of two degrees centigrade is considered to be uh, a game ender. Um, but uh, we are already above 1.5 several times in 2023. This is a, compared to the pre-industrial level. So uh, in one sense, uh, it's a done deal, 1.5. So two would be next to impossible uh, the, because fossil fuels are rising, especially in Asia, just, just right. And the history of fossil fuels already in the atmosphere from the industrial countries will be here for another several decades. So given that, um, uh, you know, we have passed the uh, dreaded 420 parts per million, it's already gone. Uh, and the costs of dealing with it are huge. I mean, roughly put, if we want to somehow keep it to four, two degrees, and if the spending is brilliant, then it's like 4.5% of GDP, just incrementally for climate action. So Reserve Bank of India's very interesting report uh, just a few months ago came up uh, with a number which is consistent in a different way. India, at the current rate, will lose 4.5 percentage points of GDP only from labor productivity decline. People can't work in that damn heat. It's just too much. So in Vietnam, they are uh, planting rice at night. Um, so the laborers in India and many parts of South Asia would be working, uh, skipping the afternoon. So the labor productivity decline alone is four and a half percent. According to the you know, serious conservative financial institution, so the link between finance and climate may be the one that will wake us up because that comes down to dollars and cents, right? So there's no harm in taking a, a very low hanging fruit in terms of what will move people. Because at the end of the day, we can have all the estimates that like in the previous 4.5, this, the, but if it comes down, it really comes down to what we want. Just as an example, COVID-19, 20 trillion was spent in, um, dealing with the crisis, 20 trillion. Uh, in the case of the financial crisis uh, of 20, 2008, 10 trillion with a T. In climate change, you are talking about the developing countries, you had 100 billion from the developed countries and you can't even come up with that, right? So why is that? At the end of the day, what people are saying, the political will, what is it? Isn't it what they think would, keep them in office. I mean, that would be if the, if the public screams, I think they, there would be a reaction. So at the end of the day, that may be uh, the uh, key point. I'll keep moving uh, only in the interest of time. Uh, today being, a, this being an afternoon, we probably will wrap up in an hour or so, uh, right? Um, it's okay, uh, slightly, okay. So uh, this causality uh, relationship, uh, uh, certainly correlation, but causality is uh, probably what will really move public opinion. Uh, you, uh, I, I wonder if you would agree. That is to say, um, the um, emissions are going like the orange line, very steady, up and up, it's very clear. Like a glove, if you're an econometrician, you probably won't be able to sleep at night. It's just tightly bound with that is the blue line, which is the temperature. So there are little ups and downs, but this, the direction is very clear. So if you have a picture like that, I mean, causality, I mean, correlation, no doubt, but causality, well, if you just do a mental experiment, A and B, and if B cannot cause A, and A and B go like a glove, then A must be causing B. I mean, that's a, that's a bit of a stretch, but you can make that argument. So here, um, you, it's hard to imagine um, that uh, global warming is causing the 
fossil fuels to rise. So if they fit like this, however you slice and dice, then you could say, wow, maybe the emissions are causing the global warming, QED. So that's, but there have been econometric studies that make this point very strongly. And half a degree difference makes all the difference. It's a huge thing, it's like human temperature. Uh, you know, if you go from, uh, in Fahrenheit, you know, from 100 to 105, 0.5, uh, you know, it could be the difference between uh, one, one of 101 to 101.5, the uh, emergency room or uh, intensive care. So in this, a lot of things mention what difference it makes. But one example would be uh, rice, maize, all these uh, crops. Uh, the estimates look like if it is 1.5, you can live with it and even have a productivity increase of one, two, three percent in the coming decades. But if it goes to two, then we are looking at minus 10 in productivity. So that's pretty big. And, you know, that's a, a huge impact on agricultural productivity. Just to take the middle line, crop yields, just that one. And you can keep going. The sea level rise is what really scares people and say, um, the coast is South India and uh, Southeast Asia and, and also China. I mean, the sea level rise, it's a double whammy. The ground is shifting down um, and uh, the sea level is rising. So cities definitely will go under. And Mumbai would be a case in point. And Kerala would have many points like that. Where do you go? The density of population is very high. Jakarta can move, thinks they can move and probably will uh, destroy the uh, uh, remaining rainforest. Uh, but yeah, so sea level rise, which is at the bottom, is a huge one. But crop yields is, is, is another uh, deadly uh, impact. So with all of this, the question is really this, in the middle of the 2018 floods, how do you think about prevention? How do you, how do you think about prevention? That's really the question. Because this is, if it's human made, and if you can predict that is going to happen, it's hopeful because human action will, can in principle reverse it. The problem is we are not set up to doing that. Uh, ounce of prevention, you can say all that, but uh, you know, it's just, it has a cost. I mean, the medicine doesn't taste so good. And the cost here is a carbon transition. It costs something. It's hard to imagine that the bigger cost is not doing something. It's hard to think that way, right? It's, so it comes down to our, uh, the way we are wired, I think. Um, so we need to make prevention a top priority. It's easier said than done. I mean, there are all these estimates, you know, if you disaster prevention, how incredibly attractive it is in benefit cost terms, okay? Um, and uh, if you did that, of course, this picture just simply shows that on the left side, uh, the increase is the blue area, increase in the cost of uh, 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 worrying about disasters. And if you did that, uh, the impact in terms of the disaster after the catastrophe strikes, the straight uh, uh, vertical line, that would be uh, the blue a part that is saved. And it could be much stronger than that. So it's a very conservative picture showing that um, the benefits way outweigh uh, the costs, um, and uh, particularly for remote areas and so on. So now there are two pieces of the climate thing that we have to keep in mind, right? I mean, one is the adaptation and the other is mitigation. You know? So far, I've kind of talked mostly about mitigation, avoid, prevent, take action ahead of time, etc. But adaptation is huge also because the carbon in the air is already uh, cooked. So whatever happens to the mitigation side, you've got to adapt. But uh, equally, if you only adapted, which is a tendency for many countries who, who uh, uh, tight on resources, let somebody else mitigate. That's also problematic, right? It's like, you know, the ceiling is leaking. Uh, adaptation would be putting a bucket 
So we can make the bucket bigger, uh, better, but at some point you've got to stop the leak. Uh, and that's mitigation, right? So the world has to mitigate. Maybe Pacific Islands, you know, if they mitigate it or not, nothing will happen, nothing will change. But China, India, of course, the OECD countries to begin with, they have to mitigate. But here the focus for a minute um, on uh, adaptation, it's a whole range. I, I thought I had a picture, um, uh, I, I don't have it here. The low cost ones, um, uh, you know, would be the housing uh, innovations in Kerala. I mean, really it's, it's uh, catching on that the first floor would uh, be for the water to flow. No one stays there. The second floor, you are protected a bit better. And it's in the same style as Indonesia after the tsunami. They built all these escape centers, which function as schools or anything, hospitals even, during the year. But then when the floods come, people stay on the second floor and the water goes through. Or, you know, tying the roofs uh, extra carefully. Uh, it's a 5% additional cost to the cost of building the house. Not huge, but it is it does cost. But you have to make that extra effort. So that's also Maharashtra, Kerala, many are doing that. Those are low cost, but this I just flagged just to make that point again, that Japan, Singapore, but China, so Japan and China, both, this, these are big tourist attractions, of course, you know, underground water reservoirs. Sponge City of, is to absorb, and it's really great for Kerala uh, to, to be effective in that, that the water, is absorbed to be released over time. In both cases, they found that the data that was used to plan for the worst case just wasn't good enough. So China, the last floods, it had no effect really because the data was based on 2014 when this was started. And Japan uh, having spent uh, uh, five, uh, sorry, three billion suddenly realized they need to spend five billion because 99 percent of the reservoir was already full with the 2019 flood so another one would uh, would flood tokyo so they are increasing the thing so that point about you know build back better uh, looking forward that ties into this adaptation story uh, on capital intensive this may be beyond the reach of many 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 countries unless technology changes. So making the point that the adaptation is essential, but there are limits to how much you can do uh, um, uh, only with adaptation. And so we come to mitigation again. Uh, it is also uh, expensive. And uh, the red areas show countries who are big emitters who must uh, adapt, I'm sorry, mitigate more but the gap is huge. So I guess we also, uh, India also falls in that category with uh, the US and China uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, that uh, according to the uh, study here, that uh, the mitigation needs to go much further. One, just one detail, I mean, for interdisciplinary work. I mean, this is all highly interdisciplinary. This, this picture may not be that easy, uh, clear in a, in a slide, but it is essential in the left hand side of the ledger is really a sensitivity analysis defined as move one variable at a time. So central bank um, doing um, uh, central bank doing um, uh, uh, an analysis of how much uh, stress a system can withstand uh, if the interest rate went up by one. So just one variable. So that can work for many things, but for climate change, you have several things happening at the same time. The health impact is there, uh, more uh, pa pathogens and so on, uh, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So you need a scenario analysis and that complicates. So we are not even doing the sensitivity analysis on the one on the left. So uh, the case for uh, strengthening the analysis of work to motivate public opinion, I go keep going back that how difficult it is that needs to be done. So uh, now I'll speed up really a bit more. Um, 
uh, the India, India as a, at night said. So India is categorized among the top five in uh, climate uh, vulnerability. I guess you can make a distinction between exposure and vulnerability. Exposure would be I'm in harm's way. Vulnerability is I may or may not be in harm's way, but if something happens, I, I can withstand better. So that's vulnerability. So on vulnerability, India is ranked very high uh, on the wrong side of the ledger. Um, and um, so these, these disasters are, are a different story. I mean, they're, they're not the usual disasters. I mean, Andhra Pradesh, Jammu and Kashmir, Uttarakhand, Uttar Pradesh, Delhi. So these pictures um, um, are telling us that something ter terribly different is happening. And in Kerala, like all other states, but just to put a focus on it, it interacts with the environmental crisis. The Gadgil Committee's report uh, was prescient. I mean, uh, it was ignored. Wow. I mean, it said that if um, mining proceeds at the current rate, all bets are off. Uh, but environmental regulations, do you think, are they tighter? What about Virinyam? Are, are, the, are the environmental safeguards any better after the Gadgil? If anything, I think they've gone the wrong way. Uh, there is no beach left. Uh, so climate change has something to do with it. But this point, uh, uh, graph is just, uh, sorry, slide is just saying that this is interaction between environment that if you, uh, we are not careful with mangroves and so on. Already deadly impact of climate change will be just that much greater. And it's not just Kerala, right? I mean, Uttarakhand would be a classic uh, case on again on on the difficult side of the uh, of the equation on uh, uh, development gone crazy um, uh, and uh, unable to withstand the melting of the Himalayas. Um, so projects without safeguards, um, uh, this, these are all published studies, right? 2.62 um, square kilometers of land already eroded away from the shore from the Thiruvananthavaram over a 14 year period. And there's a long list, I've looked at some of them. Um, and um, they are very much making the case that if Kerala is embarking on a, and rightly on an infrastructure drive, can we just take that extra 0.5% of the project cost for safeguards, social and environment? The benefits are huge. Why, 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 what's the problem? The analysis also can be done. It's just uh, the public pressure in this case is also there. Maybe it's not widespread. Um, so that would be the message on that. This is the graph that I thought I had, I should have had it earlier on Kerala and Maharashtra uh, adaptation, low cost compared to the Japan and China cases. So at the end of the day, uh, can, we may have to mix, given the budget constraints, innovation into the resilience building story, because there's only so much you can do by spending money alone. So one example, maybe the third bullet, um, the, the Fukushima uh, disaster in uh, Japan. So they are very good at um, doing these drills. So uh, students would be very prepared if something goes wrong, you should go and seek higher ground. But there are norms and protocols. And this was the level at, to which you are supposed to go if it's a tsunami type thing. So the girls in the secondary school, uh, they were also looking after the uh, sorry, yeah, junior. Uh, they were also looking at the younger ones. But when they saw what's coming, they said, this is not what we were preparing for. I've never seen this on the slides. Uh, this is something else. We got to do something different. They took it upon themselves to break the rule, which is so important for them, and seek even higher ground. And of course, it takes up time, but one child was killed. Uh, as opposed to, you know, total disaster everywhere. So innovate, uh, res resilience building in real time was a lesson. Um, also on mitigation, so India is a case in point. I mean, th this one, maybe if you have this time in the discussion, we can come back. 
uh, India is aiming for 2070 um, net zero. Uh, I, if everybody said 2070 net zero, uh, game over. So, <laughs> so, but where is the money going to come from, right? So this picture, these this people in Bloomberg imagine, oh, no, no, so let's say India will do it by 2050. So the fighting chance. Then the difference is uh, 7.6 trillion going up to 12.7 trillion. That's the additional needed uh, to aim like that as opposed to 2070. I thought it was a neat piece of work. But the bottom line again, I think is the second bullet. 5% of future GDP will need to go to do the 12.7, uh, sorry, yeah, to do the 2050 uh, net zero. I believe it's in India's self-interest to do that. It's not to please anybody else. Uh, it's completely driven by domestic needs because it has spillover effects on being better prepared for disasters and, and, and so on. But we, we, this is debatable because it's, it, it, it has a trade-off with some of the other important expenditures as well. At the end of the day, um, aside from mindsets and all of that, there is something economists could do that could help. Um, so the paradigm shift, there are many things mentioned here, but the main thing I would like to say is that if we worship GDP, gross domestic product, I don't know if any of what I said would work. Because at the end of the day, um, politicians, leaders, and ourselves, we do uh, put up GDP figures and rank countries, and investment does go to countries that are ranked high. So if the ranking is GDP, uh, why would you blame someone for not aiming for the maximum GDP? But GDP, the first letter is gross. Well, how, have you ever heard of any index where you don't net out the damages? Uh, I mean, even for medicine, you'll say, oh, okay, net of uh, the side effects, this is the real benefit, right? But in the case of GDP, if, if, you, if you start a war, it goes up. If you build a, a shipyard without safeguards, GDP goes up. So all the incentives are stacked in favor of any kind of growth, not growth that is sustainable, inclusive, and sustainable. So it sounds like all kinds of words, but it's, there's something real there. So can business schools please switch from GDP as a measure? It's just stop it and look at any kind of triple bottom line kind of indicator. And, uh, you know, as an example, one excellent indicator that I recently looked at carefully was the UNDP's 2019 report, which is they repeat every year, is on um, human development index qualified by the impact on the environment. And you see the ranking jump all over. Uh, so Norway and all, they look fantastic. They're one and two, even on just HDI, human development. GDP, you know, some others will be even ahead. But including health and education, that's great. Norway would be high, yes, Singapore would be high. But if you take the per person, you have to be consistent. If the health is per person, the planetary impact has to be per person, right? So if you do per person, then Norway slips to 15. Singapore goes from 11 to 110, I think. It's a complete change. I'm not saying this index is good, I mean, perfect but it tells you what is it that we are missing. And so in addition to mindsets, if economists can give a little bit of a boost, at least don't give the wrong boost in uh, valuing sustained, sustainable growth uh, as opposed to GDP, that might underpin, but the agenda is huge and we have a lot to go. And this self-promotion book of the book uh, does have chapters on all the things that I mentioned. So, Dr. Biramani, may I stop here? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, you know, Thomas, for those uh, very 
uh, informative and a very thought provoking uh, uh, discussion. Um, so uh, now I invite uh, Dr. Srikant Gupta, Professor Srikant Gupta, uh, to give his comments. Professor Gupta. He was there. This mic is not working. This mic is, uh, mic is not working. Mic work, Emily. Yes, my PowerPoint can be turned off. I mean, stop share. Oh, okay. This, this, should, be this should go. Stop share. Stop share. Yeah. Stop share. Stop share. Yeah. Hello. Good afternoon. Yeah. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Viramani, uh, Professor Thomas, uh, just making sure the technology is working properly. So, uh, uh, am, am I audible? Yes, you are audible. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, well, uh, um, I'm really honored to be part of this uh, uh, discussion. And uh, I must say that I met uh, Professor Viramani uh, very recently in Bhutan, and I should I should come to I will I will talk about why Bhutan and talking about Bhutan is very important in the context of uh, Professor Thomas's uh, talk. So, but I'll come to that in a minute. Um, I also worked at the World Bank uh, where uh, Professor Thomas. I'm deliberately calling him Professor Thomas because. Uh, I can never quite make out whether he's uh, an academic or a policy expert because he's been wearing so many hats. So along with uh, having this very distinguished uh, stint at the World Bank, where as you heard, he was um, helming the World Development Report. Uh, he's also had a very uh, stellar role, particularly the Lee Kuan New School as an academic. And now in front of us, we have this uh, wonderful book. So I will divide my comments into uh, two parts. Uh, first, I will just make some general comments. Uh, and then I will also talk about uh, the book uh, on which uh, this talk was based. Uh, the first thing I would like to say is that, you know, the word climate change now is highly misleading. I think the word change should now be changed to climate emergency. So instead of talking about climate change, we should try to change our way of talking about it. So we should be referring now to climate emergency. And the word emergency obviously has a certain connotation. Emergency requires response in a very quick way. So I think that, uh, you know, sitting here, if we deliberate on this, and I think we should come back to this, and I would definitely like to hear uh, Professor Thomas's views on this, that uh, Professor Thomas, if we started saying we have a climate emergency, uh, then perhaps people may change the discourse. Because as you rightly said, that you know, you've been talking about this for a long time. There was no traction. Even today, uh, Professor Thomas, if you look at the number of questions that are being asked in the Indian parliament on climate change, there are very few. You can actually go and look at the data. And I was talking to some people about this. So when we look at uh, the, the the parliament, uh, it seems there's so many other issues. And obviously, there's a news cycle. And there are many other important issues in our country. 
but the word emergency perhaps and i think we are in an emergency as you rightly mentioned that the 1.5 degree target has been uh, the the limit has been breached repeatedly in 2023 so we are in a in an emergency i can't think of this as some being some you know gradual change unfolding over time and if we start thinking in those terms then the whole way we frame the problem and the way we think about the responses to the problem may change so that's something that i wanted to just put out there you also very rightly mentioned this um, interaction between risk and uncertainty and i'm reminded of this um, uh, you know the way that i forget who it was but they said there are known knowns and there are known unknowns and there are unknown unknowns so the known knowns are the sort of the risks which we can quantify then the known unknowns are situations where we have uncertainty in the sense that we know there is a problem but we don't know how uh, we can't really put a number to it we know there is uh, something that's going to go wrong but we don't know uh, how how what the probability is and then there are of course unknown unknowns you know so in the covid context which you also i think very nicely brought into the discussion we have disease x you know what is it going to happen where is the next one going to come from so i think this whole idea about focusing on risk and uncertainty uh, in your book i think is is extremely timely extremely important and i'm reminded uh, because you know i as an economist uh, at the delhi school of economics uh, uh, do a lot of climate economics and uh, we obviously i think some people in this uh, in in the room would know of uh, professor martin weitzman marty weitzman and marty weitzman talked about the fat tails so weitzman basically the and that from there came out weitzman's dismal theorem and what weitzman was saying was that the climate uh, sensitivity or the the yeah the 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 climate sensitivity uh, parameter which is the equilibrium response to say a doubling of co2 concentrations in terms of the temperature response is of the fundamental uncertainty in climate economics and what that really means is that if we approximate this uh, uncertainty or this distribution by our normal distribution which is uh, where the risks uh, fall exponentially in the tails uh, then we are making a big mistake and i'm sure uh, this audience knows of it but let me just spend a minute explaining what i'm trying to say so in a normal distribution you normally have uh, 99% of the density lying between uh, plus minus 3 standard deviations but in a fat tail distribution like a pareto distribution which has a sort of a right skewed distribution you have what's called the fat tail so particularly the fat tail on the right so what we have on the horizontal axis is essentially the the temperature response to a doubling of uh, co2 concentrations let's say so if you if you have this fat Uh, if you have this right tail like a pareto distribution where you find that there is to use uh, weitzman's words there's a lot of uncertainty lurking in the tail so if we now have these fat tails so you could probably be uh, grossly underestimating the impacts of climate change if you think of uh, these risks as being a simple normal distribution or a thin tail distribution so put simply uh, Weitzman fat tail idea essentially was that you can have a low probability uh, event but uh, the low probability is not negligible it's a, it's a finite probability uh, but then the consequences of that would be uh, extremely disastrous so let me again try to make it uh, perhaps even more clear uh, that if you have a very small probability but not negligible say you have a 5 or 10% probability of a doubling of uh, co2 concentrations leading to a temperature response of say uh, 6 degrees celsius i mean that is absolutely uh, unimaginable so this uh, temperature sensitive uh, sensitivity or what they you what you would be calling the equilibrium climate sensitivity uh, is a situation where you could have a, 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 a low probability but a high impact event but in your book you go on and you say no but we have to now rethink we have to say high probability high impact right so that's the 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 figure you have in your book so then that goes back to my earlier point that then if you are talking then even fat tail is probably not the right way to think about it the right way to think about it is an emergency we have a high 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 probability high impact event 
My last general comment before I would like to talk about your book in particular is about this whole notion about the interplay between resilience and risk. And I think that's also a very nice way of thinking about the problem. And as you in your book said, resilience uh, shapes risk. So in a sense, risk is to some extent endogenous. So there are things that we can do to, to make our system more resilient. And uh, up to a point, I, was, uh, I, I caught on to that phrase that you used right at the beginning of your talk when you said, uh, up to a point. So the up to a point uh, is a very important uh, point that you made. Uh, so you were talking about resilience and adaptation. So adaptation is one way to think about resilience that we are better prepared but as you also rightly said in the book later that uh, resilience is not just about adaptation but resilience is also about mitigation and why does one say that one says that because uh, we understand i mean resilience i guess uh, is you know you stretch a rubber band then it comes back but if you pull it too hard then it just breaks then it doesn't come back to its original uh, state so that in the climate context would be something like tipping points. So I think you didn't mention it directly, but I think in the background you were alluding to tipping points. So once we have these tipping points, and once you have these non-linearities, uh, which you know, we economists are not very good at thinking about this. So we think of smoothly convex damage functions. We think of marginal changes, and hence, you know, when we do these uh, benefit cost analysis, we are comparing marginal damages with marginal benefits, and so on and so forth. What if these are nonlinear? What if these are what if these are 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 discrete big jumps? Can we still adapt to them? Perhaps not. So that's why I think you said rightly that adaptation alone is not enough, but we must also start thinking of um, of of uh, mitigation. And then, of course, you uh, brought about this uh, net zero of India of 2070, and that is, I completely, you sort of, you know, echoed my, or read my mind. Uh, any person, whether we are an Indian citizen or not, knows that if India uh, is going to do net zero by 2070, then you're exactly right, it's game over. Um, which doesn't mean that, you know, other things don't need to happen. You've mentioned climate finance, you've mentioned other things. But whatever be it may, you know, unless, because India is now the third biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. I mean, let aside this concept of, of uh, per capita. The climate doesn't know per capita. The climate simply knows that there's a total concentration of GHGs. So India, India was not a part of the problem, but India has to be a part of the solution. And I think we would all, we would all agree on that. So I think uh, those are my uh, sort of, uh, you know, very quick thoughts. But if, uh, if uh, Professor Veeramani, you permit me, I can just take five minutes to uh, yes, dwell please. directly on uh, Professor Thomas's book. Yeah, please, sir. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, uh, this is amazing, you know, and I think this is where Professor Thomas's training also or work at the World Bank is important because, you know, uh, we who are purely academics are somewhat very long-winded. We write these big, fat books. But as you know, the famous statement that I'm writing a, a, a long letter because I don't have time to write a short letter. So, you know, I mean, this book is 195 pages and it has nine chapters. But, you know, in, these, in this very concise way, the, the kind of the, the, the depth of analysis that I found was quite remarkable. And I'm not saying this just for the sake of saying it because you see so many books and, you know, people are saying so many things. But... I guess one of the things that uh, one also learns at the World Bank particularly is uh, being very kind of you know precise and being able to communicate ideas in a very um, in a very polished and succinct manner and I think that kind of thing uh, combined with academic kind of insight is not a very common uh, ability so uh, and in fact you know I mean again uh, as as uh, and this may be betraying uh, professor thomas's earlier training the, the book, the introduction begins with the takeaways. So it's like, you know, when we read these reports, you have an executive summary. But this is, this is not exactly that, but it has these seven points. So I guess for those of uh, you in the room who may not have read the book, I would say at least read the, the seven takeaways. And I'll just take one minute to, or well, maybe two minutes to quickly summarize. I think most of them came out in the slides. 
uh, is simply that, you know, first is this notion of attribution that Professor Thomas talks about. That, you know, everybody says, oh, well, but, climate, you know, there are all these extreme weather events happening, but we don't know whether that's happening due to climate change. But I think that, so he's talking about, you know, that you must attribute these extreme weather events to climate change. And I think you, again, if you start thinking about climate emergency, um, you see that, yes, it's not some, there are no questions about it now. Uh, what the world is seeing in terms of extreme disasters, climate disasters, is being caused by climate change. And as uh, and his second message is about communication, and that I've already mentioned, that, you know, being able to communicate is very important. And this very news cycle driven um, world where today it's the, the war in, uh, you know, the, the whatever is happening in, in Palestine or it's Ukraine. So, you know, the news cycle is always very short term. And to stay on the message about climate change is extremely important. As they say, it is always the news of our lifetime, but never the news of the day. So I think that point that he's making is important. The third point that he makes in the book is about the high probability, high impact events, not simply low probability, high impact events, which I've already mentioned. And then uh, just to uh, change the order, he does talk about this, uh, this synergy between uh, adaptation and mitigation. And I have already, I've already dwelt on that. And that I think is really important. Uh, and then I think uh, the last three points uh, that are made in this book, which again, uh, Professor Thomas has already mentioned, one is about innovative thinking and what he mentioned about, you know, building on stilts so that the, the storm surge uh, kind of passes under, underneath. And I know that this is being done in Indonesia and places like that. And also recently you may have heard that even in Florida, uh, they are building communities in a way that they can, you know, at least uh, be resilient to uh, to some extent to floods and so on. And that out-of-the-box thinking is, again, what he's flagging in the book. Uh, the last two points, of course, one is about finance, that you rightly said that, you know, uh, money makes the world go round. So money is uh, really important, which brings me to the last point, which uh, where, he, where he challenges economists, and I couldn't agree more, is about uh, the the sins of mainstream economists and you rightly mentioned um, ignoring natural capital though you didn't use the word but in your book itself uh, your your chapter on this begins with uh, the most appropriate quotation from uh, someone who's been talking about this for a long time which is professor parthadas gupta and parthadas gupta you have quoted is no one would know from national statistics that natural capital is being degraded even as GDP is growing. So as you've rightly said, we are, we are guilty of that because we keep worshiping at the false altar of GDP and as if GDP growth uh, is the be all and end all. And uh, this is very clear that, you know, uh, but the problem there is because we are not looking at natural capital, what gets measured gets managed. If groundwater is depleting in Punjab, and we are using bigger and bigger, bigger uh, you know, pumps and spending more electricity and energy to pull out the groundwater, then uh, the GDP is growing. Like you mentioned, you know, war could show an increase in GDP or uh, COVID or some illness is a great increase in GDP because suppose you even have some simple thing like dengue and uh, we are buying more, uh, you know, preventive measures, spending more on medical costs. But what we are ignoring there is the human capital that is getting destroyed because people are falling sick. Similarly, when nature is sick, when na natural capital is being degraded, we are losing the productive base of our GDP. And I think this point is well known, at least uh, Parthadas Gupta and the late Karl Yoran Mailer kept making this point. And I think it's very important that you have uh, highlighted this in your book. And then you have talked about this uh, whole notion of ignoring externalities. And uh, you didn't directly mention this in your talk, but I'll, I, this will be my last, uh, last comment, is that, you know, uh, so let's think of India now. And we are thinking of, you know, we, as you've also said in your book, that we are still building, you know, these, um, so for example, you have said that, um, the kind of expansion of coal seems uh, seen in 2023 with new plant approvals and exports. And uh, I, I mean, you know, you, you obviously it's not just India that's doing it. 
but india is still building new coal plants while india is pushing towards renewable energy now we know we economists know that we actually if we were to price a coal based ele electricity at its true social cost there is absolutely no economic case for coal based uh, based plants in our country and i'm not now talking about the social costs of carbon uh, even if i were of course uh, social costs of carbon are high and if you build them in but even if you ignore the social costs of carbon if you if you just look at the local externalities that fossil phase uh, fossil fuel based uh, plants are causing uh, in terms of the uh, mortality and morbidity due to particulate matter then that itself makes if you if you factor in those costs then that itself makes uh, coal based plants uh, unviable compared to say renewables i am sitting right now in delhi and i'm envying you all sitting in 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 uh, thiruvananthapuram because uh, if you have been reading the newspapers the air quality in delhi for the last few days has been awful and uh, personally i have been nursing this chronic headache since the last two days because the air quality is so bad so the synergies between uh, climate change and local air quality are well known and even if we are not as you rightly said if we are going to do mitigation this is not out of being charitable to the world but it's out of just looking after our own people i think it is it is a, a very evident case that uh, things like pursuing uh, you know not factoring in local externalities is 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 um, is extremely harmful so to conclude um, i i am quite uh, delighted uh, to see this book to read this book um, very succinct nine chapters i think uh, pedagogically if all of us pick up this book uh, you know within uh, we can read it uh, fairly quickly but it also is a lesson to us to how to write impactfully but write concisely so i am absolutely delighted uh, to uh, to read this book and also to see these key seven messages and i would urge uh, all of you to at least you know focus on these seven messages so i will conclude with that thank you very much thank you uh, professor gupta uh, for your really useful comments and um, uh, we will now continue the discussion and uh, we'll open uh, this to the floor um anyone uh, professor santakumar you want to come <laughs> no it is open to all but uh, you can start That's my problem. This is uh, something interesting, and but my sense, and uh, these days I work on. Uh, land restoration or the ecosystem restoration in different parts of the world and of course ecosystem restoration is also beneficial for reducing or increasing carbon sequestration so i'll just talk about a few instances you know very recently i was in i was looking at the peatland restoration in indonesia and some of you may know that you know peatland is something that can burn and it can create a lot of it can emit a lot of carbon dioxide to atmosphere. So everybody knows that you now burning peatland is harmful. So in that sense, I think the global benefits of addressing climate change is no. So, but the real problem is that the distribution of the cost and who is actually compensating it is the real issue. For example, Almost everybody in Indonesia will say that, okay, burning peatland is harmful. But not burning peatland is very costly to people in Indonesia. Because actually, you know, peatland is there, can be there in forests, urban areas, even in rural habitat areas. And the easiest way to convert peatland into an agricultural land or an industrial plant is to burn it. If you are going to use any other method, it will be very costly. 
So it's quite obvious for the ordinary people to burn it. And if you don't want them, if you, they, if you don't want them to do this, I think there should be other viable transfer mechanisms. And Norway was doing, transferring some money, but it didn't reach the people there. And uh, government may accept it openly, but government is not really willing to take up the, take up real efforts to control the burning of the peatland. Two weeks back, I was in Gatshiroli in, uh, in Maharashtra. And in India, after all the discussions, we have a lot of uh, regulations on mining. We have a fairly good mining regulation procedure. But now mining is catching up in the tribal belts of Gatshiroli without any concern for any, without any concern for the regulation, without following any standard. So here is the question where we have a fairly good global practice regulation on paper, but it is not enforced. So here we have to ask this question, you know, what is the kind of social incentive for enforcement? So in one sense, making law is not sufficient. Creating awareness is also not so enough, not so enough, but there should be some, we should be really thinking about the social incentive. So internal, you know, how do people behave and what drives them to behave? And how do we see that this global or national collective action problem is solved? And that could be a serious issue. And sorry for taking that much time. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Thomas, you can respond to both the discussions or, or maybe okay, we can take uh, more questions. So, so one, uh, one issue that I thought may I will uh, raise is that Yes, um, uh, you you are talk. You have highlighted the seriousness of the problem and the uh, importance of you know looking at adaptation as well as mitigation. So, as uh, Shandagumar also pointed out, this is uh, again uh, accepted. Now the question is, what is the way to go uh, about it, particularly about this finding a solution for this concern? So you suggested certain. Uh, ways like you know uh, like for example as uh, as an example you mentioned the way buildings can be constructed some examples from different parts of the world you mentioned but apart from those specific examples, as a general solution which is more based on like you know as uh, professor shandagumar also mentioned not not based on individual solutions that uh, may be a community or a particular nation may respond in a particular way when they see that there are issues that they are facing. Apart from that, as a more general level, what is the way forward? Of course, uh, you need finance for all this. That is also uh, well taken. But then I am thinking as an economist point of view, is there an economic solution to this problem? Like, you know, uh, because we know that uh, from economics, we know that the basic understanding is that agents respond to incentives. That is a very fundamental uh, to any economic uh, argument. So are we in a position to create incentives uh, which is uh, consistent with the climate goals? You know, are the institutions, policies, regulations, etc., are coming up in a way and market mechanism also coming into the picture in a way that right signals are sent to the economic agents so that they respond in a way that is also addressing not also that is addressing primarily addressing the problem of uh, adaptation and mitigation otherwise if we don't fix that problem first people will behave in a particular way policy makers will initiate policies in some other way. So these two things should go together, the incentives that the people face and what we want to achieve from the point of view of the uh, climate concerns. So as you rightly pointed out, yes, GDP, the way that we measure it and look at it is faulty. There is problem with it because it doesn't address the concerns that uh, you raise uh, about climate change. But then uh, what is the way, like, you know, what is the way out? Like, you know, can we make also GDP um, a kind of, you know, the, this as an opportunity for the people to uh, make money? Like, for example, there is a climate change and then uh, if you have the right type of policies, 
uh, increasing GDP is a way in which you can also address the problem of climate change. Is that possible? Like, you know, uh, so people have their incentive to make money and make profit. But at the same time, if the incentives or rules of the games are set in such a way that you make money, you make profit, but at the same time, uh, you get it through a mechanism in which you also address climate uh, related concerns. So what I am trying to point out here is that are there market based solutions uh, to this problem, which would not be like, you know, peace solutions. It's more like uh, that you are, uh, you are implementing something that all agents uh, respond to it. And then you are giving the right signals to households, firms, uh, governments and everybody to respond in a way that will also address the problem of uh, climate change. So this is what, uh, so do, do you have a, uh, uh, like, you know, yes, we, we, we know that there are, uh, you know, uh, carbon uh, market uh, related instruments which are in place, to what extent they are effective? Are they working? And uh, do you have any, any point to say about those things? Sir, if I could humbly add to your question. Um, uh, so you were talking about the incentive mechanism and uh, the importance of tweaking it in order to ensure a broad-based solution to uh, climate change. So uh, I have also been working on this area, and I find that there are a lot of uh, new you know measure incentive new measures coming up like the green supporting factor the dirty penalizing factor etc in the both uh, both in the macro prudential as well as the micro prudential uh, uh, risk mitigation uh, measures adopted by banks uh, globally but uh, uh, you know, when it comes to India, we are at a nascent stage with respect to these measures and uh, even globally uh, if we look at the um, you know, uh, opinions of several uh, um, central bank governors, including Professor Raghuram Rajan, he was like uh, against uh, central bankers going behind, uh, you know, um, sustainability uh, and uh, said that it should be in the realm of the uh, governments or the public finance uh, people. So I would just like to know your take on that and how far these, um, these incentive mechanisms like um, dirty penalizing factor, green supporting factor could change the incentives for the agents and also sir one of the major hindering factors which i feel with respect to climate research and especially in the in, uh, intersection of climate and finance is the lack of availability of data especially for developing countries like india so uh, if you could please tell me like any database which you are aware of thank you thank you anything any other comments or questions Yes. To your talk, but it's sort of taking off from uh, some of the discussion that's come up also. Uh, so I agree with um, uh, the the questions that have come that you cannot really deal with this without thinking about people. But when we think about people, I found it interesting that both of you use the term agents because I just cannot think of people as unmarked. I see them as so marked by whatever location they come from. And I think that the way in which we respond uh, comes a great deal from our social experience. So I don't think women, and women are not an unmarked category again, you know, and men. So this whole way that we've conceptualized our economy, where care, uh, of bodies is not part of your GDP or <laughs> whatever domestic product. Labor is not produced, right? And yet we know that labor is produced. So can we actually have a much more complex take on the agent? I think people are important that we need to take people into account by, you know, addressing this large thing of climate emergency and, and you know, the disaster or the crisis that set, that is, looking us in the face, but we need to have a more complex handle on people. Uh, 
welcome dr thomas thank you very much for that fantastic presentation uh, my point is uh, we were all talking about government side of things you know the policy kind of things what can be done and uh, professor veeramani was mentioning about the points that can be you know mentioned uh, and uh, the broad based approach uh, if you are looking at the solution you know the kind of uh, finance or the policy that government has i don't think it will be able to really address the situation so the possible other uh, you know other arena is you know the uh, how private sector can you know contribute so is there a way or have a thought been put on to that in multilateral institutions and i am sure that public private partnership and private sector development are all the new in things uh, which are coming up and to what extent we are really uh, you know looking onto it i mean the, the flip side of it is actually we know the adanis and uh, you know etc working on mining in you know across the world and there is a lot of hue and cry and all coming on that but uh, more than uh, csr you know csr is uh, you know may probably a, a small sector or a small a small bunch of investments that would come in but other than that how can we really you know bring private sector into this and try make sure i mean not on the new projects which is coming up because there are regulations which would say that when you are coming up with a new project i mean these are the sets of things that you should be taking care but on investments that are already made or uh, maybe how much they can contribute to the development of uh, you know climate change and i mean how can they they those people be brought into and can that be possible or Th those kinds of things thank you yeah. yeah okay okay um thank you thank you very much uh starting with um professor gupta and all the comments that followed um i i, I don't know if i have taken so much notes for any seminar um ever um so i guess most of the points uh, i mean this is um, <clears throat> exploring what more and and clarifying what exactly uh, is the nature of a lot of the comments which i i definitely also would like to be part of uh, uh, that, that that exploration but let me just uh, take a couple of things uh, dr gupta if, if it's okay with you um, uh, you know the publisher of this book has asked for a second edition right away uh, because it's so fast moving uh, that uh, it it gets outdated so fast so it only came out in april may uh, uh, yeah april may and so i'm working on that so if i could adopt the uh, climate emergency and give all all the credit to you uh, that would be really appropriate uh, climate crisis as opposed to climate change was one big change but you're suggesting climate emergency and that clar clarifies the changing nature of risk re resilience so i thank you for that suggestion um then linking many of the points but also kind of grounding it uh, on uh, dr gupta's comments uh, you know we all recognize there is a public goods problem uh, tragedy of the commons problem with a difference that in the case of even the tragedy of the commons um you, you people get together and find a way to make fishing a little bit more sustainable if the property rights are there and uh, if you have institutional arrangements this that and the other and elinor ostrom won a nobel prize for really focusing on market solutions to uh something that looked like a terrible public goods uh problem with no solution in the case of climate change we have something more super than the super super wicked in the book i call it a super super wicked problem in the sense that rather than converging to a solution it diverges uh, into a non solution in the following sense when it's warmer you run more electric um, air conditioning you can see it in southeast asia especially i see you jump into a cab and it's freezing all of a sudden and they said oh it's so hot outside so we got to run it more well immediately you have to use more fossil fuels where are you going to get the renewables overnight and the latest data from 2023 that all the vital signs are going the wrong way 
So rather than converging like the global commons of uh, Eleanor Ostrom, here you have a divergence. So in that sense, we have to take this externalities a little bit differently. So all that discussion about trade-off incentives, and I have a colleague at, in Singapore who teaches with me political economics economy. He says, you know, wh there are some problems that you face that you just solve. I have to solve. It's not so much anymore the world of trade-offs. Take an example. One third of Pakistan goes underwater in 2022. 10% of the GDP is wiped out. Who are the people who perished? They're all the poor. Now you tell me what is the trade-off with poverty reduction? If the poor are dying from this disasters, um, what is the trade-off with poverty? You, you have to address it. So he says, this is uh, Ben Kashor, uh, it's a Yale professor who is on uh, loan to uh, Singapore. He says, you know, slavery, you solve it. You don't uh, sit and uh, quibble over the fine details of trade-offs. Now, are we in that world? I mean, I'm an economist, so I also feel that if the incentives are not there, people are not going to move. So while recognizing that point, and we may well be there, and that's where Professor Gupta's emergency comes in, let me aside or take uh, or uh, show my empathy for the economic incentive side, because in the end, without that, it doesn't seem to work. So then all the examples that we had today, coal, uh, oil and gas, IMF estimates, they are all telling us that the ex negative externalities, so-called negative spillover effects, are of an order of magnitude we had not recognized. And that's about people's health, not agents' health, right? So the IMF says the financial fossil fuel subsidies are 500 billion with a B, global. But the social subsidy for fossil fuels is $7 trillion. Why the difference? It's heavily health damages from coal and it's heavily climate damages from oil and gas. I've looked through these numbers. They're very well done. I mean, you know, whatever you may think about these organizations, they, they are well done. They're calculated, you know, cross-checked. It's all okay. So if that's the order of magnitude, then I, I think I have to say, we've got to take that on and stay in the world of trade-off, but recognize the true cost and not the private cost. Private meaning, uh, you know, what, uh, what an individual sees. But here I quickly come back. In the case of mitigation, we should be talking about global mitigation. In the case of adaptation, it's local. So in the case of adaptation, uh, Kerala would invest so much, Maharashtra would so invest so much because we will directly benefit from it and no one else will run away with the benefits. So that's okay. But in the case of mitigation, uh, if you are in <clears throat> uh, Fiji, a very small footprint and if the uh, coal use goes up even in EU, but definitely in China, India and Southeast Asia, that's bad news for them. And so that's the part that needs to be mitigated so the financing for that let's come up with that would, would, that would be that would be the uh, the take on that um, and and then amount of money that is needed um, uh, the analogy with covid and the vaccine and all of that uh, they are relevant if if that is recognized as a game ender or one that will stop us in the tracks and even existential wouldn't humanity come up with the money for the global mitigation, not for Fiji, uh, but for the global mitigation. And it is still not clear, but that's where I say the public opinion should move the needle. And here, let me tie up with the question on, um, um, on uh, so I mean, uh, Shanta Kumar's uh, land restoration is a great point too, and um, uh, transfer mechanisms to make even peatland uh, so, um, you know, only, only qualification I would add is, you know, burning um, biomass in the houses and this and that, you know, switching to electricity is also costly. 
but we recognize the social benefits, right? So people have moved. It's gone from biomass was 70% a century and a half ago. Now it's uh, probably below 10%. So society supported it, and so you know, global organizations should support it. I would say the same thing here. Peatland burning has to go. But how? Yes. But let's recognize the social benefits, just like we do in the case of uh, biomass uh, or you know, uh, toilets and all, all the examples where humanity benefits, so you get it done. But then tying up to the private sector point, absolutely. I think the government, I know we ended up uh, looking at the government to come up with the money. But some of the revolutions like digital, iPhones, does anyone know where the money came from? We have no clue. There was social support, certainly no objection, and uh, they just got financed. Uh, so this bottom, uh, <laughs> the top down of COP28 needs to be coupled with the bottom up and I think it goes back to the public opinion thing that somehow uh, this needs to be seen as what. And then add to that, I think, uh, uh, Professor Viramani's point, that um, it, can it be uh, economically attractive? So there, a lot of work, I mean, starting with Ernie, uh, to uh, Nicholas Stern, 2006 report, say that you know going green is highly profitable and productive employs more people but it somehow doesn't quite have that traction because it was if it was true private sector would be running in right it's not happening so let's see whether we can push that and one reference is imf again came up with a report in 2022 uh, it's a pretty good report on what is stopping the private sector from benefiting over taking advantage of this great avenue. So they say on the supply side, they are very cautious, they are risky, they don't know the governments will last, the feed-in tariffs will stay, et cetera, et cetera. And on the other side, the projects prepared for this, they're not great. And I have looked at hundreds of them, and they seem to have a point. I, this ESG projects, especially from South Asia, I don't know why, especially from South Asia, are, are terribly presented. I mean, they just don't, if I'm sitting on the other side, so God, what, what, tell me what are the benefits? How are this clearly bigger than cost? So it's not exciting the financier where the money is kind of there and it could have been. So I think on the incentives and on the economics of it, um, there is potential, but we have to do quite a few things. Um, and I leave it at that with a huge thank you for all the comments in the interest of time. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you so much. So basically, the you know the bottom line is that as economists, we need to not think about the trade-off between econo uh, no, GDP and or growth and environment, rather than think in terms of how to make it a win-win situation both for GDP growth as well as environmental sustainability. And there can be technology-based and, uh, and also solutions-based in economics, which you can think about to create it as a win-win situation for both. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Well, thank you, Professor uh, uh, Srikant Gupta. Thank you so much. Professor Gupta, thank you so much for joining. Uh, uh, yeah, all the best.